The program you are about to see is part of a Cal State Fullerton President's Symposium, where we offered a forum to some of the nation's leading voices on the important and pressing issues impacting and challenging public higher education and our broader communities. We hope you enjoy the program and trust it will provide valuable insights about the important issues, impacts, and challenges facing us today. At Cal State Fullerton, our daily mission is education and knowledge creation. We're committed to being a leader in creating the future of higher education. And it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Martin Gillens, Professor of Politics at uh, Princeton University. Um, I have read some of his articles and I will state categorically that he is a great example of excellence in scholarship in our profession, in our discipline. Uh, he received his PhD from University of California, Berkeley in sociology. And before becoming professor of politics at Princeton, he taught both at Yale and UCLA. He is an author of numerous articles uh, on political equality, mass media, race and gender, and welfare politics. He's been published in the American Political Science Review, the American Journal of Political Science, Journal of Politics, and the British Journal of Political Science. His forthcoming book, Affluence and Influence, Economic Inequality and Political Power in America, is due out very soon. And I hope that we hear about that book today. Thank you, Professor Gellens, for coming today. Thank you for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you to everyone who's made this uh, actually very interesting and stimulating uh, conference possible. Um, the work that I'm going to talk to you about for the next half hour or so um, all comes from this forthcoming book, Affluence and Influence. Um, so unlike some of the other speakers, you won't find a bibliography slide at the end of my presentation. If you want to know more, you're going to have to wait till July and buy the book. Um, so um, the, the questions that I address in this book uh, concern, as the subtitle suggests, uh, the connection between economic inequality and political power in the United States. And um, in particular, what I look at is the extent to which government policy reflects the preferences of the public and more particularly differentially reflects the preferences of different subgroups of the more and less well off. I'm interested in this book in exploring how that representational inequality in responsiveness of policymakers to uh, what the public wants has changed over time and across different sorts of political conditions um, and what sort of factors uh, kind of strengthen or weaken the connection between public preferences and government policy making. And um, uh, if I have time, maybe toward the end, we'll talk a little bit about what sort of mechanisms there are, what sort of levers uh, exist that could be used to try to, uh, at least to a degree, address the uh, tremendous imbalances in the ability of people who are less and more well off to influence what their government does. So in order to uh, assess the extent to which public policies are responsive to the preferences of the public, I've collected a data set of about 2,000 different questions, survey questions, that ask whether a proposed policy change at the federal government level, uh, uh, whether respondents support or oppose some proposed policy change. So these include all sorts of policies, economic, social, uh, you know, raising the minimum wage, sending troops to Bosnia, abortion policy, um, pretty much anything I could get my hands on. So a very wide-ranging set of policies. And they cover a time period from the mid-1960s to 2006. Um, in each case, the basis of the analysis that I'm going to be showing you is how strong the association is between what the public says it wants or what some subgroups, say affluent Americans, say they want, um, how, uh, how popular a given proposed policy change is and the likelihood that that change will be adopted. Okay, so that's what I'm looking at through all of the, uh, the work that I'm going to be presenting today. Um, and what I find is um, a relationship, great, that's, um, uh, that looks like this, um, that 
Yes, uh, there's a positive <laughs> sign here that uh, more popular policies are more likely to be adopted. That's what we would expect. We do uh, live, at least to that degree, uh, in a democratic uh, society. Um, a few other things to notice, though, about the nature of this relationship. First of all, there's a very strong status quo bias. Right? So policies, like on the left side uh, of the chart there, that only have support among 10 or 20 percent of the public are very unlikely to be adopted. Okay, and this, this slide here is reflecting the preferences for all Americans, that is to say, across all income levels. So those unpopular policies are very unlikely to be adopted. But popular policies on the right side that are supported by 80% or 90% of the public um, still only have about a 50% chance of being adopted. Okay, so strong status quo bias, which is not surprising, right? I mean, to a great extent, our government was constructed precisely to make policy change difficult. And we've got multiple veto points in the federal government, supermajority requirements in the Senate, and there's lots of reasons to think we would find a status quo bias uh, as reflected in this slide. Another thing to point out that will, its importance will become apparent um, as we look at the uh, subsequent analyses is that there's no one sort of magic number, right? There's no place where, respond, where the probability of a policy being adopted suddenly jumps up. And there's certainly no reason to think that majority preference in the sense of, you know, is it over 50% or under 50% makes much of a difference. <coughs> right, so a policy that is sort of weakly opposed and a policy that's weakly, adopt, uh, weakly supported, um, assuming this is the point, yeah. So around the middle here, right, of the distribution doesn't really make much difference in the likelihood of that policy being adopted. In other words, policymakers have, for those policies where the public is close to evenly split, a lot of room to maneuver. There's no big political cost to supporting or opposing that policy, or for that matter, a big gain uh, in terms of public opinion. And then the last thing to notice is that at any given level, except maybe at the very bottom, uh, there are many policies that are, in fact, adopted, and also many policies that are not. Right? So there's lots of other things going on at any given level of public support that are influencing whether a policy change occurs or not. OK, so this is the basic shape of the data that I've collected. And what I do is I build a statistical model to try to predict the probability of policy change based on the degree of support. And whoops, that looks like, like this. So the black line are the predicted uh, uh, percentage of changes that are adopted, um, which it's nice to see uh, follows pretty much what the observed data suggest. Now, what I care about, of course, is how that relationship differs for people at different income levels. Right? So the survey questions that I've used ask people uh, whether they support or oppose some given policy change, and also, uh, of course, what their income level is. And if we redo the same analysis, use the same statistical model for people at the bottom, the middle, and the top end of the income distribution, we get a, relation, a set of relationships that looks like this. So high income, the red uh, line on this chart, shows the strength of that relationship between policy preferences and government output, government uh, decision making, for people at the 90th income percentile. The blue line for people at the middle income, 50th income percentile, and the green line for people at the 10th percentile of household income. Okay, 10th percentile, that's only about $15,000. It's below the poverty line. Uh, on the other hand, the 90th income percentile uh, is about $130,000 in household income. And uh, so that's not what we would really consider rich, but these are affluent Americans, right? They're people whose, well, by definition, whose income is higher than 90% of the uh, American population. So we do see a stronger association for the preferences of people at the top of the income distribution than those at the middle or the bottom. But those differences are not all that dramatic. Now, one of the reasons why those differences are not all that dramatic is that there are many policies on which people at different income levels agree. Right, so of the data that I've collected, of my 2,200 or so proposed policy changes over these decades, about half of the questions show no discernible, no significant difference between the preferences of those at the bottom or the top of the income distribution. 
Right? There's just a lot of things that may differ by party, they may differ in other ways, but not really by income. Now, one of the ways that I've taken this into account, or maybe the right way to put it is, um, in order to get a better grasp of the extent to which these three different income groups influence policy making, I've restricted the analysis only to those questions where they do diverge uh, in, uh, in their preferences. And if you do that, and so looking at, say, questions on which people at the 10th and 90th income percentiles diverge by at least 10 percentage points in how they answer a set of uh, these proposed policy changes, then you get a very different uh, relationship, right? So high-income Americans still show a strong relationship between whether they support or oppose a policy and the policy being adopted, whereas for the low income, when preferences diverge, there's no relationship at all, okay? Whether they support or oppose or what proportion of low-income Americans support or, or oppose a policy has absolutely no predictive value in uh, guessing whether that policy will be adopted uh, when, when preferences diverge. Now, for anyone who cares about uh, political equality, this is a disturbingly flat line. Um, on the other hand, we might think that, well, maybe poor Americans differ in their preferences not only from those at the top of the income distribution, but from middle-income Americans as well. Right, so if the poor are sort of idiosyncratic in the preferences that they hold, then a well-functioning majoritarian democracy, in fact, should not reflect their preferences. Right, so more telling might be what happens when people at the median income level, 50th percentile, when their preferences diverge from those at the top. And if you've got my slides in front of you, you already know the answer to that. And that is, it looks exactly the same. Okay, when preferences from middle and high income Americans diverge, we still see that same evidence of influence over policy outcomes for those at the top, but no evidence of influence for those in the middle. And if I repeat this same exercise for people at the 10th, the 30th, the 50th, and the 70th income percentile, in each case, looking at the set of policy changes, or proposed policy changes, where their preferences diverge from those at the top, we see consistent and st fairly strong relationship between the affluent uh, and government policy making, uh, and very weak or no, uh, and no st certainly no statistically discernible relationships for those who are less well off uh, than the 90th income percentile. Now it's important to note that this doesn't mean that poor people or, or middle income Americans never get what they want from government. Right? So first of all, there's that set of questions where preferences in fact do agree across income levels. And in that case, people in the middle or at the bottom of the income distribution are just as likely to see their preferences reflected in government policy as those at the top. Um, and, um, and it's also true that even affluent Americans often don't get what they want from government policy. Right? We saw that strong status quo bias, which was true as well for the preferences of affluent Americans, just like it was for the public as a whole. And it's also important to point out that there are many policies which disproportionately benefit the less well-off, but which receive strong levels of support across the income spectrum. Right, so things like raising the minimum wage, the earned income tax credit, federal support for education, social security, these are all issues where there may be somewhat stronger support among the poor than among the affluent, but where, there's strong, where, where those differences are minor and there are strong support even among people at the very top of the income distribution. Okay, so this isn't a story about all government policies favoring the rich. Um, it's a much more subtle and complex uh, result that comes out of nevertheless this uh, uh, situation where only the affluent seem able to influence right, what the government does. All right, now, so, so this is a sort of overall summary of the relationship between preferences and outcomes across these years of the data that I've collected. But, um, but one of the key questions that drove me to engage in this decade-long or so project uh, was the question of how this relationship has changed over time and how it changes across political conditions. 
So let me start by looking at a uh, change over time. And one way to do this is by dividing up my data into the different presidents who are represented uh, uh, in the time period that I examined. Now take a second to reflect on this slide. These bars are, like in the previous slide, reflecting the strength of the association between public preferences and policy outcomes for people at these three different income levels. And this is not at all the relationship I expected to find. Right? So in the Johnson administration, right, we see very weak uh, responsiveness to public preferences among any, for any income group. Certainly not what I expected to find. I would have thought, you know, you think of Johnson, the Great Society, much more responsiveness to the middle class and the poor than I would have expected to find for other presidents. And certainly for Bush 43, George W. Bush, I would not have expected high levels of responsiveness to anybody except maybe the most affluent. Now, like a good political scientist, when I found these results, I said there must be some mistake in the coding. I did everything I could, <laughs> you know, to make them go away. But, uh, but they were very persistent. And, um, and so, so I want to try to explain those. Um, and I should also point out that you see this same, or same pattern even more clearly if you look, again, just at preferences where there's a divergence of opinion across income groups. So in the top, those policies on which the 10th and 90th income percentiles diverge, and in the bottom, the 50th and the 90th. Uh, and again, weak relationships for Johnson, virtually no relationship indeed, um, strong relationships across the income spectrum for George W. Bush. And in the intervening years, a sort of steadily increasing uh, level of responsiveness to the affluent, but not really much going on uh, for the middle class uh, or for the poor. All right, so what explains uh, these patterns of, um, uh, of representation? Um, there's a number of influences. Um, I'll focus on a few of them. Let's skip over that. Um, OK, so um, since I want to save some time for discussion, I, I'm not going to talk about the specific policies that are sort of represented in those differing relationships, but instead focus on the sort of systematic factors that the analysis suggests are influencing those patterns. And, and those are these. Um, first of all, the electoral cycle. That is to say, the four-year quadrennial federal election cycle. Um, we know from previous research that congressional voting tends to align better with public preferences when there's an upcoming election. Not especially surprising, um, but I would expect to find the same thing with these data. Um, so election years should result in tighter associations between public preferences and government policy. Um, gridlock, okay, the amount of change that is adopted in any given year. So other work has shown that the extent to which policymakers are gridlocked um, or on the other end of that spectrum, a lot of policy is adopted, um, varies quite dramatically across political conditions and across years. Um, and, um, and we usually think of gridlock as something that inhibits the responsiveness of policymakers to the preferences of the public or indeed to anything, to addressing the nation's problems more generally. Um, I also looked at changes in partisan regimes, that is to say what happens when a new party takes over control of the White House. And this is something that um, political science has shown to uh, result in um, a shift toward more popular policies, right? which is often the reason why the old party lost the White House, because their, pop their policies became unpopular. And there's a number of different sort of theoretical explanations for this pattern, but it's, um, it's one that has been documented uh, often by a number of scholars. And finally, I look at the size of the majority party's seat advantage. And that is to say, so sometimes you have a Congress which is fairly evenly divided between Democrats and Republicans. And sometimes you have one party that dominates. And when you have strong party dominance, like say in the Johnson years, right, with very strong Democratic uh, control of both houses and a Democratic president, that party is to a substantial degree insulated from political pressures. Right, those are the conditions under which a party can pursue the policies it most prefers. And, um, and there's reasons to think that the parties might uh, prefer policies that align differently with different income groups. Uh, 
Um, and even that parties may prefer policies that don't align with any income group, right? They have their own set of, um, of sort of interest groups and um, kind of policy demanders that they respond to. So very briefly, what I found, so in, in this slide, the size of the dot represents the strength of the association under that condition. And so the four different dimensions that I've discussed, whoops, are uh, aligned here, up and down. And then we've got um, on the left side, the conditions that produce greater responsiveness, bigger dots. And on the right side, the conditions that produce lower levels of responsiveness. And so, so this is what responsiveness to the three different income levels looks like during presidential election years. Okay, a lot of responsiveness to the affluent. Substantially less, but still some to the middle class and to the poor. Um, congressional election years, much lower responsiveness to everybody. And over here in non-election years, um, <laughs> responsiveness only to the affluent. Okay, so looking over the slide overall, what you can see that, first of all, there's very, there, nobody gets much responsiveness when it's not an election year. Um, gridlock actually worked the opposite way from what I expected. So it turns out when gridlock is high and few of these proposed policy changes are being adopted, those are the times when the policies that are adopted are most consistent with what the public wants. And I talk in the book about how gridlock can serve kind of as a filter. It blocks policy making, but it does a better job of blocking unpopular policies than popular policies. Okay, so the consequence is that it's only those policies that are most consistent with what broad swath of the public wants that are able to sort of get through this gridlock filter, right? That impose a big enough cost on anyone who would stand in their way that they are adopted. So gridlock works, and it seems, to be, whoops, it seems to benefit the affluent and the middle class, and not so much the poor. New party regimes are, as expected, uh, associated with greater levels of responsiveness, but really only to the affluent. And finally, a seat advantage, when the seat advantage is small, that is to say when the parties are evenly divided in Congress, uh, you do get higher levels of responsiveness, as both parties are sort of vying right, for the support of the public. Um, and when the control of Congress is uh, most uncertain, right, so the stakes are highest for, um, uh, uh, for appealing to the public through their policies, then again, responsiveness to the affluent and much less so uh, to the middle class and hardly really at all to the poor. All right, so together, these various factors, we'll leave out the election year because that's the same for every president, but these, these other three factors explain all of what makes the Johnson years unique. Right? So when we take these things into account, then rather than seeing low levels of responsiveness uh, to everybody in, in, uh, during the Johnson administration, uh, what you see uh, by including these in a statistical model is that um, you've got levels of responsiveness to the poor and the middle class in the, those years in the 1960s that are higher than any of the other presidents that I have data for, um, and levels of responsiveness to the affluent that are lower. Now, that doesn't mean that that was really what was going on in the Johnson years, right? What was really going on is that policies did not reflect the preferences of anybody. Um, but these are some of the reasons why. Because gridlock was low, because there was a very large seat advantage for the Democrats who could push through to some substantial degree the policies that they wanted. It was not a new party regime, uh, and so on. Um, and these factors also explain a lot of what was going on with George W. Bush, especially in the early years of his administration. And um, uh, in order to assess uh, the political dynamics, because the political dynamics changed a lot between the early years of George W. Bush's first administration and his second administration. Right, so when Bush came into office in 2001, Congress was very evenly divided. In fact, the Senate was split 50-50 for a couple months. Uh, you know, the Republicans lost seats in both houses. Bush lost the popular vote. So it was a set of conditions in 2001 and 2002 that were conducive to policy making that was consistent with the public. Whereas 2005, after the 2004 election, uh, this was the first time we had unified Republican control. 
right, of the federal government since Eisenhower. And, um, and policy making, uh, so the, the conditions changed rather dramatically. And the, uh, the uh, associations between preferences and policies changed as a result. So dividing up those, the Bush data into those two periods shows that in the top row for the two, first two years of Bush's first administration, there's high levels of responsiveness across income groups like we saw a few slides ago. But looking at 2005 and 2006, when the Republicans gained complete control of the federal government, responsiveness plummeted. Okay, now one possible explanation might have to do with the declining popularity of the Iraq war. And so I reran these analyses, but excluding all of the questions that dealt with defense and the war on terror and so on, and found pretty much the same thing, that in the uh, first two years of Bush's first administration, you have high levels of responsiveness to public preferences, and once again, those decline dramatically. Okay, so conclusions um, from these analyses. First of all, under most conditions at least, representational inequality in the United States is absolutely enormous. Uh, you saw those graphs with substantial levels of responsiveness to the preferences of the affluent, and when preferences diverge, absolutely no evidence of a responsiveness to what the middle class or the poor prefer. Uh, we also saw that responsiveness to the affluent increased over time across those presidential administrations, whereas responsiveness to the middle class and the poor seems to depend on this very sort of special constellation of political conditions, such as we found in 2001 and 2002, but absent those conditions, no responsiveness to the preferences of the less well-off, again, when preferences across income groups diverge. Uh, third conclusion is that the political parties, which are often seen as the most important mechanism for translating the public's preferences into government policy, uh, it may be true that those are the most important mechanisms, but they're not very reliable mechanisms, right? And in particular, parties have their own agendas, right? And they behave as policy maximizers, not as vote maximizers, right? So political scientists have written a lot about how parties you know, are forced to appeal to the median voter and try to maximize uh, the, uh, the popularity um, by choosing policies that the public endorses. And, um, and that is occasionally true. But when parties are not forced into that role, what they will do is adopt policies that please their sort of core supporters, their activists, their allied interest groups, and so on. And those are the periods such as 2005 and 6, or the mid-1960s, where you see it most clearly that, that uh, government policymaking is, uh, is unresponsive to public preferences. Uh, and finally, political circumstances matter, right? So if there's a dark side to the fact that circumstances have to align just right to get representation for the less well-off, well, the bright side of that is that political circumstances and political uh, mechanisms uh, do matter, right? That elections, to some degree, work as advertised in forcing parties to adopt policies that are more consistent with what the public wants. And so that's the sort of ray of hope in this work, that if political conditions matter, then we may be able to make changes to make those conditions matter even more. And... Um, um, I guess I'll just say briefly, what, what can we do? Because even though that's not, you know, what I'm good at is like finding problems, not identifying solutions. <laughs> um, and in that, I, I guess I have to say I'm like most political scientists. Um, but nevertheless, everyone feels incumbent in the last chapter of the book to identify like, all right, well, how are we going to fix this problem? And, um, and what can be done? Well, here's um, at least the kind of directions that the, analyses in this book suggest would be the most promising. Um, so one thing is campaign finance reform. That's fairly obvious. If we can reduce the role of money in government or reduce the extent to which money that pays for the political process comes from the most affluent, we may be able to shift that responsiveness, at least somewhat, down the income scale. So that can be a function of things like campaign finance reform, um, per se. Um, it can also be 
a function of other changes. So for example, in 2008, the, the Obama campaign raised a considerably larger portion of its money from small donors, uh, in part due to things like the internet. And if those kinds of trends continue, then the sources of campaign money and other uh, sorts of money in politics may shift. Um, there's other sorts of electoral reforms we can point to, things like non-partisan uh, uh, districting, get out the vote efforts, and so on, which have been shown to increase political competitiveness. Right? So even aside from the role of money in elections, how competitive the political environment is uh, influences how responsive the parties are to public preferences. And so that may be another sort of avenue, another lever that can be used. Um, and finally, as I suggested at the beginning, there are many policies that are beneficial to the middle class and to the poor, but that are uh, supported broadly across the income spectrum. And that's another strategy for people who's, uh, who are concerned with uh, the nature of political responsiveness and its inequality um, to use to address uh, these kinds of issues. So in conclusion, I guess I'd say that um, uh, you know, these kinds of changes um, are not going to be easy. Um, we seem to be going in the opposite direction on things like campaign finance reform. Um, but these are all political decisions. Uh, you know, Citizens United was a five to four, de a five to four decision, and uh, you know maybe the next uh, campaign finance case that meets the Supreme Court will be a four to five decision instead. <laughs> Thank you. Question. I got a quick one. A couple of things you mentioned, sort of pointing in the direction of. Uh, the literature that I haven't seen much of lately, uh, the divided government literature. Uh, relevance of that phenomenon. Uh, yes. So, um, well, I was looking more at the nature of the division in Congress that clearly divided government, which usually refers to the three you know, the House, the Senate, uh, and the White House, um, it, you know, clearly relates to the same kind of a dynamic. When there's one party, you know, unified government, um, then that party tends to respond to its interest groups. And so, uh, so that is quite relevant to what I'm doing and, and suggests that while unified government may be better, although this is controversial, but it may be better at actually getting stuff done, the stuff that gets done is actually less consistent on average with what the public wants than when government's divided. So, so I guess I'd view that as kind of a, a trade-off in terms of you can get more stuff done, but it's not necessarily going to be more democratic uh, in the sense of consistent with public preferences. Uh, my question is two-part question, I guess. Uh, how effective do you think, Alec, is the American uh, Legislative Exchange Council how effective do you think they are at getting their laws uh, passed? OK, um, that's something I'm certainly no expert in. And I mean, just from reading the newspapers, you'd think they have done a pretty damn good job. Yeah. Uh, and just for those of you who may not know, this is an organization that sort of writes model legislation for states that is then it's Republican or right leaning um, and then gets adopted and introduced and often passed by state legislators. Second part? Oh, the, uh, I just, do you, no, I, I don't have a second part. Okay. <laughs> uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, so I'm still kind of trying to get my head around the, uh, like the, the, like the graphs you were showing. And um, you're trying to show the relationship between like policy adoption versus um, preferences, right? And um, like the result that you showed were um, the Bush administration was, or the you know, Bush Jr.'s administration was the most responsive to like policy preferences. Um, that suggests that a policy being um, popular doesn't necessarily mean that it's optimal, because mm. it doesn't seem like the Bush administration was like a model of success. But then, I mean, like, but then at the same time, like the past administrations too, like they had very low level of um, responsiveness to preferences. But then, like you know, the level of success varied. So. Um, does that, like, um, I'm still trying to work out the implications of that? Yeah, no, I think that's an extremely good point. Um, this study looks at sort of how democratic policy is in the sense of responding to the preferences of the public. 
But, um, but, but that's a different question from how good policy is. Yeah, yeah, right. um, and it's different in two ways. One, because the public sometimes is simply ignorant, misguided, or misled, right, in terms of what it wants. Yeah. Um, and it's also a different question because my guess is everyone in this room, there are some policies in which if, uh, uh, if government policy more uh, completely reflected or more equally reflected what the public wants, they would say, great. And there's other policies where if out government outputs reflected what the public wanted, they'd say, that's terrible. And, um, and not because people are misled, but because people have different views. So just one example is that affluent Americans tend to be conservative on economic issues and tend to be liberal on social issues. So if our policymakers responded more democratically to what the poor and the middle class wanted, we would have more restrictions on abortion, right? We would have, well, we haven't had much movement at the federal level on gay rights, but we would be even less likely to do so um, than we have and so on. So yeah, so it's not about good or bad and it's not about what I like or don't like. And I think those are really important questions, but very different from the ones I address. Yeah. Um well, I, I forgot to mention I have a small second part of the Okay, question. go for um, it. So in the graphs that you showed, um, in the, the decimals that you showed in the parentheses, those were the alphas, right? The, in parentheses were standard errors. Oh, standard errors? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. That's it. Hi there. Thank you very much. Wonderful presentations. I especially love the graphs also. I'm curious on, those, on the graphs where you were showing the the difference of opinion between the affluent and the lower class, or the, the lower economic status voting preferences. How many of those situations, of those 2,200 policies you studied, how many times was there that 10% or more difference? Yeah, so between the 90th and 10th income percentile, it was about half of the questions exceeded that difference. So about half the questions were included in those analyses. For the 90th and 50th income percentiles, only about a third of them exceeded that difference. Thank you. Yes. I don't know if I can ask, ask this coherently, but I'll try. In times of economic disparity like now, what's the effect of activism, like with the Wall, mm -hmm. Occupy Wall Street movement, um, which would be against the, the affluent, does it, but does it change, have an impact on policy? Yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, it's a great question. <laughs> it's a really tough question to answer. I'm not sure anybody knows, and certainly I don't. It can't hurt, and it's hard to see that there could be a lot of policy change um, without that kind of uh, sort of public displays of uh, that it's important to people. Um, but how important different social movements are, especially when they don't engage directly electorally, right? So it's a little easier to trace out the impact of the Tea Party, say. Right, because you can look at, you know, there were candidates endorsed by the Tea Party and you can try to compare, you know, how well they did in different kind of places and so on. Occupy Wall Street, is, it's even harder to assess because whatever impact it has seems likely to be more broad and maybe have to do with the kind of issues that, you know, are emphasized in the coming electoral campaign and so on, but it's very hard to trace those things back. Okay, so your numbers seem to be showing that you have to be in the top 10 percentile to get what you want through. So can you give me a sense of numbers, hard numbers, like how many people, what is the top 10% mm. income? And that, because usually most Americans think that they're middle class when they actually are not, mm. right? And then can you give us a sense of numbers of how many people actually are the ones who make the top 10%? Uh, okay, so let me, um, yes. So in direct answer to your question, um, uh, in order to be in that top 10%, you, ha you need about $130,000 in household income. Okay, so everyone who who's has household income of that level or above is in the top 10%. Um, and that's, of course, about 10% of the population. So well, what do we have, 300 million Americans? So it's 30 million people, uh, roughly. <laughs> um, now, um, but there's another question which is a little bit harder to answer, and that is like, who is it really in that top 10% that's influencing policy? And my guess is it's not everybody, it's certainly not everybody equally, and it may be that influence is really restricted to the top 3% or the top 1% or the top 10th of a percent. And if we had data on what those people want, 
um, we might be able to assess that. And unfortunately, we don't because there aren't very many of them. They don't like to answer surveys. And, um, <laughs> And even when they do answer surveys, our surveys aren't designed to identify who they are. You know, usually the survey will say, like, the top income category might be $200,000 and above. So you can't find the top 1% with the kind of survey data that I'm using. Um, so, uh, so I think it's entirely plausible that what looks, in my analysis, like the influence of the 90th income percentile really is reflecting the fact that those people, on average, agree with the more affluent you know, top 1%, let's say, um, who are really the ones who are contributing uh, the bulk of the money to, uh, you know, 401, to uh, uh, the uh, super PACs and um, uh, so on. <coughs> yes. Um, so you really messed up on my teaching because I've been <laughs> going on and on about how parties pursue policies in order to win elections while interest groups pursue, pursue uh, uh, <laughs> policy. Uh, winning elections to get, pursue policies and the median voter theorem. It's, this is a fascinating uh, thing. I was wondering if you think about it in terms of the realigning elections. Uh, I know there's some criticism about that. It seems like that dovetails with uh, administrations that are also, you know, with a, a huge majority control, which is less responsive. And yet, at the same time, right after those big elections, we would expect that the new government is winning because they're already geared to be so responsive to desire for change, like in 2008. Mm -hmm. I wonder how do you uh, make sense of that? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the difficulties with this kind of analysis is there just aren't that many political constellations or political conditions within, you know, a four-decade span. Um, so, uh, so I can't pull those different things apart with as great of confidence as I would like. But I think you're right. You would expect, in general, that when there's a big shift to sort of realigning election, that on the one hand, you would get um, greater responsiveness because it's a new regime. And on the other hand, you might get lower responsiveness because it's a party dominance kind of situation. And that may, may very well be true. It may be that both of those factors occur, and they have, to some degree, these offsetting influences. Um, so it's probably the times like um, well, like the two periods of one-party dominance that I looked at, right? So the, after the 1964 election in particular, uh, the Democrats had this very dominant majority, but it was not a new regime, right? The White House changed hands in 1960, not in 1964. And similarly, after the 2004 election, the Republicans had unified control, but it was not a new regime. So those may be the conditions that where you see the, uh, the lowest levels of responsiveness um, and, and maybe under these sort of realigning situations, responsiveness would not be as low. I've been waiting for your uh, campaign refinance policy, the reform, the finance reform, mm. all my life. <laughs> so hearing your uh, presentation, then the affluence are actually making the contribution and how the uh, politicals are, are catering to that at different times. Does that mean then that policy, this particular policy, the, op the chances of passing, making that change is really nil because the affluents are making that contribution and using that as an influence to change policy and that will actually work against uh, their influence? Uh, you know, that makes so much sense and yet I'm not sure that it's true. And one of the reasons is that on many dimensions of campaign finance reform, there's actually more support among affluent Americans than among the poor. And I don't know if that's because they like see the interests of money um, and, and you know, believe that it's more harmful to the political system than people who are less well off, um, if it's because the different groups among the affluent have different preferences. And so, um, you know, they're thinking most about like what, you know, the, the, the Democratic donors are thinking most about like how they can rein in the Republican donors, right? And the Republican donors are thinking what kind of changes could uh, hamper the influence of the Democratic donors. Um, but for whatever reason, um, uh, it may be that at least some kinds of campaign finance reform are not as unachievable, at least in terms of public opinion. Now, of course, political incumbents, right, gained office under the current system. And so that's like a, a somewhat different dynamic that inhibits campaign finance reform. 
And then, of course, we've got uh, the Supreme Court. Um, but states actually have done a much better job. Um, and there's a fairly wide range of different campaign finance uh, regimes that are in place uh, in different uh, US states. And there, there's a small body of work that looks at at least some of the consequences of those uh, like clean election laws, campaign contribution limits, and so on, um, and does find that um, elections are more competitive, um, there's more Democrats and women in legislat legislatures uh, that have stricter campaign finance regulations, um, and so on. And, um, and I would like to look at the US states uh, in terms of this kind of analysis to see whether policy under these different kinds of campaign finance regimes differentially reflects the preferences of different groups of state residents. This question is more about responsiveness than about the different income groups. I wonder if there can be a, a group that's very small but has very strongly held beliefs that actually has a kind of inverse responsiveness, maybe their ability to generate a much larger backlash than the amount of support that they can ever gain. Is that, does that ever happen? Uh, is that an important factor? Uh, OK, so just so, say a little more, because I'm not entirely sure what well, you mean by uh, generating backlash. Well, my perception is that maybe 2000 or 2004, there were small groups, maybe something like gay rights or strongly held group, but not nearly majority, especially in certain states. But it really brought out the vote on the other side. Mm -hmm. So that has it's kind of responsiveness or inverse responsiveness. It doesn't get into the income issue necessarily, but just sort of the odd nature of rebounding and within politics. Um, I haven't given that much thought. That's an interesting idea. And uh, if that is indeed the dynamic, it suggests sort of a m more democratic process. That is to say, if the ma which isn't, again, to say that the outcomes are necessarily more desirable, but, um, but more reflective of what larger proportion of the public wants if there is that kind of a backlash. Um, I think there's a, an important normative question here, too, which this work kind of nudges up against, which is, well, should everyone's preference on every issue be counted equally in thinking about government policy outcomes? Right? And if you have a group that cares deeply about some issue and then a bunch of other people who don't really care much either way, um, or maybe they have a preference, but it's not a strongly held one, might it not make more sense right, to give the former group more influence over policy outcomes than the maybe larger group who doesn't care much? And, um, and that's something that you know, I kind of skirt. And I just say, well, I'm just going to look at how well policy outcomes match the preferences of, in this case, income groups um, without really attending to who it is that cares most about abortion policy or you know, tax progressivity or whatever it is. And with that, uh, the time is, is at hand uh, for us to thank uh, Marty Gillens.